The main character says that the world is divided into several parts, the Mediterranean, where dragons, humans, and many other races live, the world of demons, inhabited by demons and monsters, and the world of spirits, where the dead live. She was a resident of the City of Spirits. It is a world where souls stay for a certain time after death and then are reborn. But the girl was not going to do that. It turns out that she was the first person to be sacrificed, and it's not even clear to whom. Perhaps there was no point in her death. With this in mind, the protagonist decides to never be reborn as a human again. The girl opens her eyes to loud shouts about the successful completion of the experiment. Suddenly, she feels that she has a body and something is pressing down on it. Not realizing what is happening, the heroine jumps up and looks around anxiously. She was surrounded by strange people in dark capes who for some reason called her a doll. The girl is silent and the people around her begin to think that their experiment has failed again. When the heroine finally asks why she is called a doll, the main man in the group explains that this body was developed by the workers of the Tower of Magicians, but they are unable to create a soul, so they had to summon a ready-made one. In this body, she will be able to defeat anyone as soon as she is given the necessary abilities. The girl, hearing the screams, looks around and notices hundreds of crippled people who were experimented on. A man, following her gaze, warns her that she will not feel pain like others because she is not human. The protagonist naturally asks if she will become another guinea pig. The magician says that she has no right to refuse. The girl elegantly rises from the marble and creates a strong blue vortex around her. The magicians do not understand how she does it, because they have not yet given the heroine any powers. She summons a formidable dragon with a wave of her hand and recognizes that her body is really not bad and it has withstood her power. The spellcasters try to destroy the heroine, but she doesn't care. She is amused by the sorcerer's attacks and orders the dragon to destroy them. The girl realizes once again why she did not want to be reborn. She has been sitting in the ruined castle for several days. She has no other options to go because she can't live among people and hardly anyone will accept a doll that doesn't age or get hurt. The girl is eager to return to the spirit world, but it is impossible with her body. Suddenly, she hears a voice and looks up to see an attractive man introducing himself as the ruler of the Demon Kingdom, the Demon King Cardell. The heroine asks if his grandfather's name was not Chester. He replies that it was his great-grandfather's name and asks her how she knows it. She says that he was always bragging about his grandchildren in the spiritual world, and it's hard not to remember him. Cardell does not understand who she is and what these strange blue lights are around her. The girl, not wanting to explain, replies that she is a test subject and that the lights are just magical abilities. They have a short dialogue, during which the demon offers the heroine to become his son's butler. He explains that he has the power of destruction and that when he ascends to the throne, he will have enough power to give the girl the death she wants. The heroine is incredibly shocked by his words. She is not sure that she can cope with the role of a butler, but the king says that her duty is only to protect the young prince. The girl finally realizes that this is her chance to return to the spirit world and accepts the offer. Cardell says that his son's name is Julian and the game has paid off. The girl doesn't understand anything and red sparks are raging around the king. Instantly, they find themselves in the luxurious mansion of the demon lord. The girl registers with an elf notary, but she can't tell him her race or her name because so many years have passed since she remembered it. Disappointed with the conversation, the notary, exhaling a heavy sigh, took the heroine to Prince Julian. As they walked, the elf told her about the rules of behavior in the presence of the prince. He strictly forbade talking about the demon's awakening because the next stage hadn't happened for 200 years and Julian hadn't matured yet. The notary also warns the heroine to control the chief servant and the maid and to be careful with the prince because now his mental age does not exceed five years. The girl's only task is to be there for him. The elf introduces the heroine to Julian and leaves them alone, referring to work. She notices a small leaf on the prince's head and wants to take it away, but he bites into her hand like a dog. The girl tears Julian away from his clothes and asks him to tell her what exactly has irritated him. He screams at her to let him go and never dare touch him. The heroine throws him to the ground and the boy, crying, unleashes all his strength under the influence of anger. 
Juliana is amazed that the girl did not die from this. She tries to calm the boy down by taking him into her arms. The prince calms down and starts talking to the girl. The heroine pinches Julian's cheeks, and he reminds her of the girl's severed head, which was lying on the floor a second ago because she touched him. The butler only jokes, calling the prince a clever young master. Suddenly, a woman with a horn on her head runs up to the characters, screaming at the heroine for raising her head in the presence of the prince. Julian explains that it is his butler, but the woman, who turns out to be a nanny, does not listen to him and calls the guards to kill the girl. She, in turn, realizes who she was told to clean up the castle. She uses her powers, and all the guards run away. The elf who led the protagonist to Julian appears, stops the fight, and orders the butler to control only the people inside the castle. The nanny realizes that she has just attacked Julian's real new butler and faints in fear. The elf asks the girl not to show her powerful abilities, which could destroy a small country, and goes to tell everyone about the new butler so that such situations do not happen again. The nanny apologizes to the girl. The prince thinks she's a necromancer, but the butler assures her that she doesn't possess corpses and lets Julian play with the blue lights of the Takebi. The boy glows with happiness. The girl slaps the prince on the head with the light, but the nanny intercepts her hand and says that it is time for Julian to go to bed. The boy insists that she let the heroine go. As soon as the woman lets go of the butler, she immediately puts her hands on the little demon's cheeks. He gets angry and chops them off in front of the frightened nanny. The girl calmly picks up her hands and asks the prince to chop them off again, because the first time it didn't work out exactly right. After a week of the girl's stay with Julian, she noticed a big change in the boy's behavior, and even managed to reduce his aggression from five times a day to one or two. Every day, the heroine did not leave the prince's side for a minute. At lunch, the boy asks what the new butler's name is and why no one has given her a name yet. The girl replies that she has no one close to her who could do it. The boy asks for permission to come up with a name for her. Hearing this, the girl naturally agrees, and the boy calls her Perry because her eyes remind him of Perry Doe. Julian explains that it is a light green gemstone, similar to the shade of the butler's eyes. She replies thoughtfully that she has never seen herself in a mirror. Hearing this, the boy orders her to follow him. The prince grabs the girl's hand, even though he had previously said that he did not like to be touched, and leads her to his room. He goes through the closet and finds a bracelet with a peridot stone, puts it on the heroine's hand, and sends her to the mirror. The girl, not realizing why Julian interrupted her lunch for this, goes to the glass. In the reflection, she sees an attractive lady with wavy silver hair, porcelain skin, and green eyes that sparkle in the light. The girl wonders why the magicians made her so attractive, even with eyes like Peridot's, if she was only meant to be a strong doll. The prince insists that the butler take the bracelet because it is very expensive, and tells her to give it to someone else if she doesn't like it. The girl thanks him, but still takes off the gift because she wants to return the bracelet to its owner. Julian is outraged by this. In a fit of anger, he cuts off the girl's hand. She says that the prince should explain himself in words, because it is very difficult to remove the consequences of his aggression. But the prince is not sure that the butler will listen to him. After all, Perry touches his cheeks, even though he asked her not to. The girl sincerely replies that she can't help but touch such a sweet child. Julian is surprised because everyone calls him scary. He is sure that there is no point in being nice, even if you want to protect and defend him, everyone will die in the end. But the butler, touching the boy, assures him that she will never die, no matter what he does. The prince shouts out that he will kill her personally if it is a lie. Perry agrees, but in her mind, she quietly mocks Julian, because she herself would like to end her life as soon as possible. The guy, fascinated by the girl's beauty, freezes for a moment. She already thinks he has wet himself or worse, but Julian shouts in shame that he is not a child. But the butler disagrees. In the morning, Perry sees a nanny outside the prince's chambers, who has come to wake the boy up because breakfast with the demon king is long overdue. The butler bursts into the room and lifts Julian over the bed. He growls at her like a small puppy. The girl tosses the embarrassed boy in her arms while he screams that she is a fool. But she replies that her name is Perry, and thank God the prince hasn't forgotten. The nurse brings water for washing, but the girl thinks it is drinking water. 
After soaking her hands, the butler begins to bathe the baby's face. He could not survive this mockery and shouted that he hated Perry and started crying. The heroine is sure that she has washed Julian well and worries that he will not faint from overstrain, so she forbids him to raise his voice no more than three times a day. The young man is nervous about this condition. The thought crosses the girl's mind that she is worried about him. The nanny informs him that he should get ready for breakfast as soon as possible. Julian jumps out of bed and goes to the mirror to take off his pajamas. The butler comes to her aid, but the irritated prince yells at her to leave him alone and chops off the girl's hands again. Perry does not pay attention to this and begs to be awakened as soon as possible. The prince asks if she will touch him when he grows up, but she answers in the negative because he will be able to do everything himself. Julian looks down at the floor and replies in disappointment that he understands. The butler turns around and sees the nanny covering her mouth with her hands. Perry is surprised to realize that she has been crying. The nurse throws her arms around the girl and says that she admires her because the young master has finally opened his heart to someone. Julian shouts that this is not true and orders her to move away from the butler. The nanny confirms her words by forbidding the boy to touch Perry. The prince says that he just doesn't like it when demons touch others and then touch him. Perry claims that she is not a demon to the happy tears of the old lady. She is afraid to ask if she is human. The butler says with a stony expression that she is a doll. Julian then tries to kill the girl with his own hands, but she repeats that she is indestructible and that it is enough to spoil her clothes. The heroine realizes that lately the prince has not been withholding his touch, but has been attacking her as soon as he has a chance. And every time he failed, he said it was strange. The butler, brushing Julian's hair, explains that dolls really can't die. The nanny apologizes because it was her duty from the beginning. When she sees the result, she calls the young master unsurpassed and thanks Perry. The butler picks up the prince under the armpit and carrying him, asks if he is comfortable. He recalls how she left him in the kindergarten and shouts that she shouldn't do that again. Ashamed, the boy watches the servants run around them. The nanny worriedly tells the girl that the prince should be carried in her arms. To explain it better, she picks up a passing boy in her arms. Perry repeats after the nanny and thinks that it is very awkward because now both hands are occupied. However, the lady claims that she cannot carry Julian any other way in front of his friends. The butler is surprised that the prince has friends and he hasn't destroyed them yet. He replies that he doesn't like them and doesn't understand why he still communicates with them. Perry, drawing the terms of friendship in the sand, proves to Julian that they are not his friends because he does not like them they are not fun, and they do not help each other. The boy is embarrassed to say that he has been helping them, so they started calling him a friend. The butler cruelly explains that this is called a useful idiot. The shocked nanny doesn't understand how anyone can say such things to a young master. The young man asks what the word means. Perry interprets without hesitation that it means a fool who gives everything to others but receives nothing in return. Julian jumps up and shouts that he is not a fool. The nurse assures him that the prince is the smartest demon she has ever seen. The butler jokes that the nanny will grow a horn if she lies. The elderly lady nervously replies that she is not lying because she already has a horn. At breakfast, Julian is happy, despite the nanny's words, and actively eats with his hands. Perry thinks that it doesn't matter how he eats because the prince is so cute. She gives the unsuspecting boy a dish. When he eats it, he is horrified to realize that the butler has slipped him broccoli and throws it to the ground, screaming that he will not eat it. Turning the prince's chair toward him, Perry asks if the young master wants to become an idiot because he refuses all food, and at this rate, his health and mental capacity will deteriorate greatly. The boy says that she is lying, because health is not related to stupid pranks. Perry explains that the brain is not well when the prince suffers. The nanny confirms her words which scares the prince. They continue to mock the young master and discuss what will happen if he becomes an idiot. Extremely frightened, the prince orders the servants to bring him some broccoli. Disgusted, he eats the vegetables and asks tiredly if that's all. The butler advises him to consider it a medicine for a clear mind and assures him that today Julian has become a smart young master. The boy asks why only today. Perry confidently says that if he eats everything, he will be smart tomorrow too. Julian replies that he is already quite smart, and the butler, reminding him of the situation with his friends, 
brings down the prince's spirits. However, she says that with a healthy diet, he can become the smartest, which makes Julian agree to eat well tomorrow. The girl, stroking the boy's head, says that this is a great choice. The embarrassed prince gets up from the table and runs out to write a letter. Perry notes that he should ask Henry to call the artist. The girl stands by while the boy writes the letter. She is surprised to realize that she can read what Julian has written, even though the concept of letters did not even exist when she was born. The heroine assumes that there is some kind of magic on her body, but it is for the best. She reads the message written by the prince and realizes that it is a threat. Julian asks thoughtfully how to describe in two words the phenomenon of having separate arms and legs. The butler suggests that it is called severing limbs. The young master sincerely thanks him and continues to write. Perry mentally admires his linguistic skills. The boy finishes writing and gives it to Perry and the nanny to read. The nanny is horrified to see that he wants to cut off someone's fingers and feed them to monsters. She shouts that it's not right and tries to snatch the letter, but the butler doesn't let her, laughing at her behind her back. The prince says that it's okay because he is going to send this letter to Lef. The nanny is even more nervous and assures him that he definitely shouldn't send this message because Mr. Lef is a friend of the young lord. Perry asks who this Mr. Lef is, and the boy replies with a serious face that he is the one who treated him like a fool. The butler realizes that this gentleman was mocking the prince and helps him write a more intimidating letter, saying that intimidation should be detailed and vivid. For example, after the phrase, tear out limbs, you can add, tear out tongue. At this point, the nanny snatches the letter out of her hands and horrified informs her that Perry should not prompt, but stop the prince. While the nurse is screaming, the young man takes out a sheet of paper and writes a new letter under the guidance of the butler. It is shorter in length. However, it is quite clear and rich in content. The prince sends the letter to the bitter moans of his nanny. The elderly woman explains to the butler that Mr. Leff is the duke's son and that she should have stopped the young master. But Perry is quite sure that a fight cannot be avoided if the gentleman has asked for it. The nanny, in agony, thinks that Julian is asking for a conflict and that Leff might even kill the prince. These words make the boy very angry, and he explains to Perry that Leff awakened a hundred years ago and is now an adult. The girl asks him if he is stronger than the prince, and he replies that he is not. The butler says that there is no reason to worry. The nanny says it doesn't work that way. Perry replies in all seriousness that they will simply kill Lef, because then he will not be able to destroy the prince. The lady explains that the demon world doesn't work the way she thinks it does. Unlike the human world, the title of demon king is not inherited. Only the one who ends the life of the current ruler will take the throne. That is why the young master has become a target for many high-ranking demons. The fact that he hasn't awakened yet means that a truly enormous power is emerging in him. Now Perry realizes that they want to get rid of Julian while he is weak. The Demon King is actually protecting the prince, even putting such a strong butler to him. But now the Duke may attempt an attack, and it's time to catch up with the letter. Perry says that she understands, and at this moment the nanny shines with happiness, and the boy shouts at the butler in anger. She kneels down in front of him and touching his cheek, says that she will be with him all the time now. Only the weak turn a blind eye when they are called stupid, but the young master is strong, so he has to stand up for himself. In turn, she will deal with all the surprises if, of course, Julian allows it. The prince sits thinking. Perry realizes that it was her job to protect Julian from the very beginning, but he doesn't like the touch of other demons, so the five-year-old is forced to wash, eat, and sleep alone. The boy, who does not hesitate to admit how strong she is, has even stopped taking his usual bodyguards with him. It can be difficult for him to bear the fact that someone is protecting him. So, she specifically asked for permission, for the sake of a child who is strong and weak at the same time. After thinking about it, the prince says that he is very strong and can destroy even Lef, but he allows the butler to help him so as not to look stupid. The nanny is happy because she thinks she can get the boy's guard back, but Julian only agrees to Perry because he is not that weak. The butler sincerely thanks the young master for his permission. Meanwhile, the Demon King decides to check what kind of letter his son wrote, because the prince hasn't done it for a long time. Who would have thought that the message would be threatening? The king is pleased to see how his son's vocabulary has been enriched. 
One of the servants says that Perry helped him. Cardell did not think that the doll could find so much. He firmly orders the letter to be sent as is. The elf who was with the king is concerned that this could be a trigger for the duke to act. But the king is convinced that a small fight between children will help Julian grow up. Cardell asks which country of people is moderately dangerous. The servant says that it could be the kingdom of Soden. They were able to develop skills in fighting demons, so they have strong armies, and their borders are adjacent to the territories of the demon kingdom. The king orders to go to war with them, but the servant objects because their troops will not move without a reason. Cardell orders that the kingdom be the first to start the war. The advisor is surprised by his actions. Then the king explains that they have a poison that is fatal to demons if they are fighting them so well. He must get it so that all traces lead to the kingdom of Soden. It's not enough to spread this poison over the duke's domain. He needs to kill a third of the population. The servant says he will send someone on this mission and leaves. The counselor doubts Cardell's decision, because if Lef manages to take over the kingdom of Soden, it will untie his hands. If this is indeed the case, the king confidently says that he will do everything to protect his son. The story goes on to say that the nanny shows the butler a list of games played by the young master's demon peers. She has been carefully writing them down in case he needs someone to play with. Perry says it's a wish list, but the lady denies it with a nervous shriek. She was just so curious about the expression on the cheerful young master's face. The butler stands at a loss for words. The nanny continues that in any case, she will not be able to catch up with the prince, so Perry will have to do it. With a serious expression on her face, the girl takes action. And the first thing on the nanny's list was a game of twist and turn, so she picks up the boy and starts spinning him. The boy screams for her to stop because he's going to throw up, and the butler doesn't understand what she did wrong. The nanny grumbles that the girl was mixing a cocktail, but she doesn't know what the word means, so she rereads the list, which clearly states that the child needs to be lifted up and down. Then the heroine decides to do the up and down exercise that Juliana usually does to wake up. But she throws the boy so sharply and high that he is not even visible in the sky. When he falls back into the butler's hands, the nanny yells at Perry to stop, because the boy is not a ball. The girl does not understand what she did wrong because, in her opinion, the young master did not fly high. The nanny, under the prince's fearsome gaze, claims that she would have burst into tears a long time ago. She offers to play a game, and if Julian agrees, he will receive a chocolate cookie. Deceived by this promise, the prince says that Perry is driving and begins to run away actively towards the garden. The girl, using all her speed, catches up with the frightened boy. The nanny scolds the butler because she should have adjusted to the prince's speed, not caught him right away. The heroine says that she understands and asks the puffed-up Julian to try again, but he refuses because it's boring. Perry excuses herself by saying that the games are too complicated for children, but the prince claims that she is just not good at anything. Finally, the nanny begs to play hide-and-seek. The exhausted prince wants to refuse because the name sounds strange again, but the nanny convinces him that it will be fun. They have to count to 50 and then look for it, but they will only be limited to the garden because the estate is so big. On a rock, scissors, and paper, they decide that the little prince will be the one to search. The butler realizes that there are not many places to hide. When she sees a bush, a spark of an idea lights up in her eyes. The prince counts to the end and goes in search. He immediately finds the nanny, who has specially hidden behind a column so that he can find her quickly. She praises his searching abilities while Julian is happy. All that remains is to find Perry. The prince sees the butler twisted in a spiral in the bushes. The nurse faints at the sight, and the prince shrivels up in disgust. When the old lady comes to, she scolds Perry very much. She brings her a huge number of books on parenting, saying that the butler needs to learn more about demons. Before going to bed, the prince asks if the girl was punished in this way. She confirms his guess and advises him to go to bed and ignore the books. Julian complains that he can't sleep. Perry offers to sing him a lullaby. When the boy asks her if she knows any, she replies that she can just make up a melody. But when she tries to sing, the prince abruptly turns away and says that he is already sleepy. After a while, the butler heard Julian's steady breathing. Takabi's flame was flying nearby and catching insects. A light breeze was blowing through the open window, and for the first time in a long time, 
a peaceful atmosphere reigned in the castle. So the girl decided to read the books on parenting that the nanny had given her. She uses her powers to make it faster, but at that moment, Julian wakes up. Perry informs her that it's still early to get up, but the prince doesn't want to rest anymore. The girl offers to read him a book. The young master asks to take another one because this one looks boring. The title of the book, The Adventures of a Princess and a Knight That Begin Every Night, turned out to be quite intriguing. The heroine is confused that princesses know how to use a sword. When they start reading, they find out that it is a story about a beautiful princess who is bullied and the knight who loved her. Perry thought it was just an ordinary fairy tale and only after 10 pages realized that something was wrong with the book. She is irritated to realize that the adventure was for adults as it contained scenes of obscenity. The butler makes the prince, who is upset by the unexpected ending, go to bed, explaining that the book is not for children. Julian shouts that he is not a child, but Perry says that he will read it only when he is taller than her. The prince complains that it will be only after he wakes up. The girl advises him to wake up as soon as possible and slaps his face and orders him to sleep. In the morning, Perry attacks the nanny at a corner in one of the halls of the estate and asks her what kind of book she slipped her. She emotionally asks if she has read it and says that it is a very heartfelt novel, especially in terms of describing the rapprochement of the characters. Perry asks why the nanny gave her the book. The lady replies that if she wants to learn about the world of demons, it is useful for her to read this kind of thing. Moreover, it is a bestseller in the demon world. When the nanny speaks for the author, she is interrupted by a sleepy prince who says that this is the book Perry read to him. The lady is speechless when she hears that the butler did read him this story, but abruptly stopped, saying that it was not for children. The young master says that he would like to know what adventures they have every night, but the nanny babbles that they need to sleep at night and there are no adventures. With a heavy sigh, Perry asks to take the books away. The lady quickly takes them out of the room. The butler wakes Julian up by throwing him out of bed, as she does every morning. The boy says that he is already awake and hugs the girl tightly by the neck. Perry seems to have gotten used to the touch and is no longer irritated. At breakfast, the prince asks the heroine what he needs to do to become an adult, but she doesn't know. He is surprised by this because the butler is already an adult and should know how to do it. Perry thinks that in the spiritual world, age does not count and she has only been living as a doll for a few months. So she explains that she is not an adult at all. She is still two months old. The prince says that Perry is younger than him, so why is she an adult? Perry asks if he wants to be one too. The boy, with his head down, replies that the book is only for adults and he has not grown up, although he also wants to be one. The butler is embarrassed, thinking that he is unlikely to say anything when he wakes up and realizes what book she hasn't read to him. The girl says that she will not read it even if he becomes an adult, and when asked why, she argues that it will be very embarrassing for him. The prince asks what the word embarrassing means. The girl explains that it is the same as shame. Julian, mumbling, says that then he is embarrassed now, because all his friends are grown up. They are ashamed of him, so they don't come to play anymore. While feeding the young master, Perry explains that he doesn't have to be ashamed of being a child because they are just not real friends. Julian wonders if friends can be fake. In turn, the butler says that they disappear in the most difficult moments, such as now. The prince realizes that he has no friends and, upset, asks if he is a failure. The girl says that it is unlikely because he even wrote a threatening letter recently. Julian, even more disappointed, replies that this will not make friends. Perry, at his own risk, advises him to be a little kinder. The young man assures her that he is really kind, but the heroine, wiping his face, explains that good demons don't aggress for no reason. When the prince asks if he has no friends because he is bad, Perry says yes with a smile. When the young man says that Lef has friends, the butler thinks that he has good sides. Julian asks what his good side is, and the girl doesn't hesitate to tell the gray-haired prince that he is cute from her point of view. He snaps at the butler quite often, but so what? The young master is very cute, and this demon will send her back to the spirit world, so she likes him too. But Perry decided not to add such details. Sitting by the window, Julian asks the nanny where the girl has gone. 
she tells her that she was called by Henry's butler and that she will be entertaining him all day. However, the prince turns away and says that it is not necessary. The nanny thinks that with Perry's arrival, he has become more like his age. Although at first the young man was silent almost all the time or exploded in anger if touched. He asks the nanny if he is cute and she vigorously assures him that he is until the boy suggests that he should cut off her head. Seeing the lady's reaction, he says that Perry is strange. On their first meeting, they didn't even have a normal conversation, and he was already tearing her head off, screaming, expressing his anger, tearing her arms and legs. But she behaved calmly, as if it was a small inconvenience. Is this all because the girl is a doll? He asks the lady to tell him everything she knows about Perry, but a simple nanny can't know much about a butler. The boy says menacingly that he knows about the nanny's reports to Henry. He grabs the lady by the throat and lifts her above the ground, while she cries out in pain and asks him to let her go, so she can tell him everything. The prince threatens her that he will tear off her arms and legs if she does not start talking immediately. The nanny says that Perry is a doll made by human sorcerers, and that she came here because she made a pact with the demon king. After hearing this, Julian throws the lady to the ground, her eyes already watering. The nurse asks if the prince suspects the butler of anything and why he has interrogated her. He replies that he does not know when she will leave him. From time to time, the girl makes a strange expression on her face, as if she is ready to disappear at any moment. Perhaps Perry will stay with him if Julian helps her instead of Cardell, but he doesn't know what she wants. The girl says that the prince is nice, so he will behave as she wants. If necessary, he will be nice or kind. Julian tells the nanny not to tell her about today's events because he is a good child. Irritated that she was called away by Henry, the butler returns to the prince's chambers. When the door opens, she is surprised by his friendliness. She has goosebumps because the young master is smiling. The heroine, fascinated by his kindness, nevertheless decides that the boy is ill. She picks him up and carries him to Henry. Opening the door to the butler's office with her foot, she tells the frightened elf that the prince is ill. He sees no signs of illness until Julian begins to smile sunnily. At this point, Henry's glasses crack from shock and his face turns stony. The butler bursts into tears. He runs after the demon king and asks them to wait a little longer. The worried prince asks if he is nice, but when Perry wants to ask the reason for his sudden behavior, a mysterious man in black camouflage clothes with a sword bursts in through the window. When the demon king and the elf enter the room to see if his son is really smiling, Perry is already angrily interrogating the beaten killers. Cardell, taking one of the assassins out of the gate, says that he is still quite green. The king gives him poison and tells him to throw the living into the dungeon and get rid of the dead. Perry asks if he can trust the servants to do this. Henry replies that the castle servants are as strong as knights, but they are no match for the butler. The girl throws up her hands at the elf's mute gaze and agreeing that they are indeed strong, throws the body of the murderer. The little prince suddenly grabs Perry by the skirt and, shining with happiness, asks her to hug him. The girl refuses because she is dirty and her clothes may contain poison. The boy, however, argues that it won't kill him and insists on a hug. The butler asks if he is scared, but the depressed boy says that he is only afraid of her death. At that moment, someone cuts Perry into several pieces with a sword, but it turns out to be a vision of the boy. Henry and Cardell are watching from the side, actively discussing how hard it is to raise a son who misses his mother. The king thinks that a male butler should be appointed, while Julian screams that the girl is not his mother. With his lips pursed, the prince says with all his stubbornness that Perry is his. Everyone in the castle is frozen by these words. Ashamed, Perry mentally tells them not to look at her like that, because she hasn't done anything. The prince asks her enthusiastically if the butler is really his, but she calmly replies that she belongs to herself. Hearing this, Henry and Cardell begin to convince the prince that if not Mrs. Perry, then they certainly belong to him. But he is offended and replies that he does not want them. This causes the men to feel heartbroken. The embarrassed elf asks the butler to simply confirm the prince's words. Outraged, Perry thinks that this is not her job, but when she sees how tightly Julian hugs her, she does not say it out loud. Who is she to say this to the prince? He may have lived for a hundred years, but he is still a child. You can't say such things to a person who is about to end his life. Cardell assures the boy that the butler belongs to him anyway, 
so he shouldn't sulk. While the prince smiles happily at this news, Perry, with a lone tear, wonders why someone else is deciding who he belongs to. While the butler and the king are discussing the decision to set a date for the celebration of the prince's first smile, the heroine wants to say that she will not be Julian's, but she is shot down by the prince's words that she should never leave him and the young man's joy. The next day, the two butlers go to interrogate the mercenaries they caught earlier. Henry says that this is also Perry's work, because they tried to kill the young master before. The girl thinks that they definitely came for Julian, because few people know about her, and they tried to kill her so that there would be no more witnesses. However, their surprised faces were something interesting. Even she doesn't know how to end her life, let alone the attackers. Henry advises Perry to cover her nose, but she assures him that everything is fine. In the dungeon, they see rusted chains covered in blood, on which are hung torn, rotting bodies, the smell of which hits their nostrils. The butler thinks that because of the doll's body, she doesn't care about such trifles and asks if they are still alive. She is told that some have not even been touched and others look dead but are still breathing. She finds out that they came for Julian, but not for whom they were working. Although the butler tells Henry that she doesn't know how to interrogate, she decides to try. She lights a Takibi light and asks the elf if he believes in the existence of a soul. Everything has a soul, whether it is a human, a demon, a bird, or a tree. First of all, the soul separates from the body after death, and the same applies to the Tokebi lights that it causes and materializes, which are also souls. And now the most important question is what will happen to the creatures who die out of a sense of resentment? Perry sends the souls of those who died at their hands at the killers, while they scream and beg for help. She says that today she will not let them leave this world and will take revenge for attacking Julian. When the prince wakes up, he asks where the girl went. She replies that she went to the dungeon because she had to punish the pagans. The nanny thinks that the butler has killed someone because there is a very strong smell of blood everywhere, but she does not confirm her guess. The girl realizes that it is from her and asks Julian to wash up and come to breakfast on her own because she needs to change her clothes. The boy, waving his head in different directions, assures her that he will wait for Perry. The heroine, having already changed her clothes, goes to the prince because she is sure that he is waiting for her. She realizes that she hasn't had a moment of solitude for a long time because she doesn't leave Julian's side for an hour. Is the heroine really so used to him? She can't get closer to the prince because the girl will go to the spirit world as soon as he grows up. A handsome blonde with red eyes puts his hand on Perry's shoulder. She is not at all surprised and asks him who he is, and he is confused because she does not know him. The man pulls Perry close and asks if he can call her by her first name. She pulls away from him and repeats her question. The irritated young man envelops the butler in a stream of his power. At the blonde man's shocked look, the girl easily rejects his magic and says that it is forbidden to use it so freely in the palace of the Demon King. The heroine wants to hurry up, because the prince will get very hungry if she doesn't come right away. The guy asks her if she feels absolutely nothing, not even a rapid heartbeat, and when she says no, he exhales in disappointment. A blonde-looking girl appears. She says that she can satisfy the butler in any way she wants, as long as she is after women. The blonde girl, spreading pheromones, asks, just like the boy, if she can call Perry by name. The butler thinks about how to deal with them, and finds nothing better than to lift them by their necks above the ground, using her strength. At that moment, Henry comes and asks the girl to let the demons go, so he can tell her who they are. The elf says that he has extracted confessions from the three murderers, and burning with anger, stabs the blonde man in the breath with his heel. It turns out that these are the head servant and maid he mentioned earlier, Leon and Leah. Perry says this is the first time he's seen them and asks if they have any work, and when he learns that their main task is to deal with intrusions, he realizes that they don't. The servants complain that they are doing a good job, but yesterday someone did the work for them, and now they just wanted to taste Perry's beautiful butler. The interrogation revealed that the mercenaries had been sent by the Duke of Zerka. Lef, to whom Julian wrote threats, is the only son of the Duke of Zerk, so it is not surprising that he targeted the prince. But Henry is not sure he has time for this, because the inhabitants of the Duke's territories are dying. 
The butler realizes that it seems that Lef was just trying to scare Julian because he can't finish him off. She calls him a coward and furiously rereads the letter. The girl is outraged that the Duke does not have the courage to challenge the prince directly, so he does such despicable things and sends assassins to stab Julian in the back. Perry asks Henry how strong the servants are and whether they can defeat Lef, and he replies that he doesn't know about victory, but they have great powers. The butler appoints the surprised boy and girl as the young master's new personal bodyguards. She asks the elf if it's okay, but he says he doesn't care, although he doesn't see a need for them as long as Perry is there. The butler introduces the servants to the prince, but he is against their presence. Leon and Leah assure him that they will hide in Julian's shadow at all times, and when they hear his menacing voice, they quickly disappear from sight. The girl asks if the prince is hungry, and he says he is not, but the nanny says loudly that she heard the young master's tummy rumbling. Before eating, Perry asks Julian to write a letter to Duke Leff. She assures him that he needs to strike back. Leon, who appeared at that moment, assures her that such letters should not be sent, because everyone is trying to hide the fact of the attack on the prince. Perry says that they didn't write anything about the assassination attempt, and thinks that this note is specifically for Leo to guess everything. The author says that demons go through three stages of awakening. All demon children must go through the first stage to release their demonic energy. After the second, magic can be used, and the third makes the body complete. On average, children of aristocrats take a hundred years to go through all the stages. However, the stronger the demon, the faster the demonic energy is generated, which can delay the awakening. Here, in the world of demons, where status depends on power, there is nothing more important. The reason why Julian is still okay is more than anything else because of Cardell's power. The nanny is worried that everything will be okay. After all, the king is unlikely to allow this letter to be sent. Perry says that they will send it secretly and gives the message to Leon. At this point, the lady screams in fright that they can't do this and that she will go with them. But the butler forces the nurse to stay here and report their actions to Henry after she and the servant leave. Cardell can try to protect Julian as much as he wants, but the Duke will wait for the right moment, but they will prevent it. It is necessary to make it clear to the Duke that even without Cardell's protection, an attack on the Prince will end in his death. Perry makes the Prince promise not to use magical energy unless she asks him to, even if it seems to him that they are on the brink of death. Julian asks what if he does die, but the butler says that he has her for that. Kneeling down in front of Julian, the girl asks if the young master trusts her, and he looks at her and says yes. Together with Leah and Julian, Perry moves in the shadows to Lef's palace, where a disgruntled Leon is waiting for them. The butler throws him a beautiful white box with golden patterns, saying that it is a gift. But not for him, but for Lef. She only let the servant hold it. Ordering the headmaid to hide in the shadow of the young master, the girl enters the castle. They inform the butler that Cardell's son, the young master Julian, has arrived and that he will escort the company to the owner of the estate. Lef sits in a chair in front of Julian, wondering why he has come. He mocks the prince, saying that he is still a child, and behind him is another nanny on whom he will soon take out his uncontrollable anger, as he does with everyone else. Seeing that a dark aura is gathering around Julian from these words, the heroine, putting her hand on his shoulder, reminds him of a promise before she leaves. She is called Julian's butler, to which Lef loudly says that a child who has not even had a second awakening cannot have a butler. The Duke says that the demon king carries the boy around like a burden. Lef reminds him that the letter said something bad had happened. Perry informs him that the prince was attacked and the culprits have not been identified. That's why the young master came here to ask his old friend for help. Lef doesn't think they are friends after Julian threatened to cut off his limbs. The Duke wonders who the other guy is with them. When he finds out that it is the chief servant, he is surprised that they are unguarded. The butler says that they have prepared a gift, because Lef seems to have been offended by the previous letter, and the thing is perishable, so it would be nice if the Duke could see it right away. Lef is irritated and says that if he doesn't like it, they will have to prepare something better. But Perry is sure he will appreciate it. Opening the box, the Duke sees black small balls of poison, part of the gift he had sent to Julian earlier, but unfortunately, some of them had already been used. 
It is unlikely that he counted on such a quantity, but Perry still asks to accept the gift. Frightened, Lef orders the knights to grab them, while Leon has already blocked the entrance door. Perry asks the young master to drink some liquid and offers to destroy whatever he wants. A week has passed since Julian's awakening began. During it, the demon has to enter a deep lake that corresponds to his power. The prince's lake is black, but the nanny, who tells the wary butler all this, had a blue lake. Perry thinks that the nanny is right and there is no need to worry. He just went into the lake to wake up, like all demons, and for some reason she is thinking more and more about how many mistakes she made in relation to the prince. The nanny invites the butler to eat, while the latter is reminded of how Julian forced her to taste broccoli. They turned out to be terribly tasteless, and the girl refused to eat them, to which the prince shouted that she would be a failure. Perry says that adults don't have to eat broccoli. The prince hints at the upcoming awakening, but the butler will force him to eat broccoli even after the transformation. The girl slyly says that the prince is good today, so she will ask the pastry chef to prepare his favorite dessert. Instead of sweets, Julian asks the surprised Perry to eat main courses and desserts with him. This is where the memory ends, and the butler realizes that once the prince leaves the lake, he will no longer be a child. She asks the nanny if he will forget her, but she assures him that all his memories will be preserved. The disappointed butler asks how much Julian will grow. The nanny says that he will be about the same height as his father, but if you measure by age, he will be 22 or 24 years old. At this age, people are already considered adults, and from some point on, they grow a mustache, and the girl doesn't even want to imagine the prince with one. Suddenly, she remembers the moment when Julian smiled brightly for the first time. If she had known it would be like this, she would have called the artist anyway, no matter what Henry said. She should have painted those little squirming fingers, because the memories will disappear one day. Leon, the nanny, and Leah come to Perry's house. They take turns bringing something to Perry while he sits by the lake waiting. The servant sees the books and asks if the head maid brought them, because they are the ones she always chooses. The butler thinks it's a good thing he doesn't know how Leah talks about him. The boy tells her that he was banned from the underground dungeon because he occasionally drew energy from Lef, which caused Henry to make a fuss. The butler asks why he eats male energy if he is a man. But Leo doesn't care about this rule, because food is food. He offers to share his energy with the girl, but when he sees the dark aura that flickered around the butler at that moment, he is terrified and excuses himself as a joke. The servant says that she is only kind to the young master and, seeing her sadness, reassures her that Julian is not dying. Everyone goes through an awakening, it's just that his power is greater, so this process takes longer. He asks Perry not to be so depressed. But the girl thinks that she is not depressed, but anxious, because something could go wrong. The prince might not get out of the lake, regret the time spent with her, see her flaws, or not want to hug her anymore. Perhaps the reason for all of this is that she was worried about the child, who exposed the cliques every time they mentioned waking up. This bitterness was caused by love, which the butler realized too late. Suddenly, a herd of knights rush to the Black Lake, eager to kill the son of the Demon King. They shout about the lack of margin for error until one knight notices a blue light. Perry appears in front of them and asks them what their intentions are with the young master. The thieves begin to mock the fact that the son of the king of the demon world is protected by only one maid, from whom no demonic energy is even felt. They try to grab the butler, but she uses her powers to grab the main attacker by the neck and repeats her question. Subsequently, Perry destroys the entire army and leaves only one survivor to take a beautiful ring with a green gem from the butler to his master. The knight from the Lake of Awakening returned to Vettel Castle and immediately came to his master a demon who looked something like Cardell. The ruler is outraged that they could not cope with a defenseless child and, hitting the table with his hand, asks how it happened that the unarmed girl left only him alive. At that moment, the frightened warrior gives him a ring, which the man recognizes as the ring of the knight's commander. The man asks who did it and learns that it was the butler. However, in his memory, only Henry was in the castle, but he uses magic and is with the king all the time. If the new knight was pitied and sent back, this is a warning. This butler could have been with Julian in the Duke's castle, where a bloody battle had recently taken place. The servant asks the master whether to send the soldiers back, 
but he replies that he should first find out where the new butler got her strength and everything else. They need to lure a powerful demon to their side. The knight says that the girl had either silver or golden hair, which was hard to see because of the darkness, light green eyes, and her name was Perry. There were lights around her that changed their shape, and he did not feel any demonic energy. The demon thinks that an ordinary person could not be stronger than an army of warriors and makes a terrible assumption that she is a dragon. But it is immediately questioned, because demons have been at odds with dragons since ancient times. But if Cardell, who loves his son, has bent over backwards to gain the dragon's trust, then this is going to end badly. Calling the demon king a madman, the mysterious stranger instructs him to send out invitations to a meeting to all the demon dukes and, as he said earlier, to find out everything about Perry. When the old butler asks what he should do, he replies that demons and dragons have signed a treaty forbidding them to enter each other's territory, and if the girl is really a dragon, it will help to depose the demon king. Perry tells Leon, who has come to see her again, that there was an attack last night, and they tried to kill the young master. The girl had to kill them all, because the prince cannot use force in the lake. The servant suggests that they were in a hurry because Perry had hastened the prince's awakening. There is a default rule that no one should touch Julian while he is in the lake. The girl is angrily happy to have finished everyone off. Perry asks her to tell the nanny and Leia not to come because any demon who comes here will die because of the danger from the attackers. Leon is always amazed by Takibi's lights, so he decides to ask if the butler is a black wizard. She says that she is a doll created by human sorcerers, so she doesn't know about black magic. The servant decides to make a joke about the butler's aesthetics, but she takes him by the scruff of the neck and stops the flow of this nonsense. While the girl is strangling Leon, who is moaning in pain, a splash is heard from the lake. Julian emerges from the water with the same black hair that absorbs the sun's rays, eyes the color of a sunset, and horns the size of a butler's palm, and one head taller than her. He runs over and hugs Perry tightly as he congratulates him on his awakening. The prince asks what they were doing here, and the heroine demonstrates how she beat Leon, to his shouts that the butler does not care about the chief servant. Julian sees the trespassers, whom Perry has assigned to look after Takebi's lights, because they are not the first. Using his powers, the prince destroys the demons and tells the survivors to inform their master that the next demon king has been awakened. The butler asks Julian, who has just appeared, if it has been decided who will accompany him to the meeting, and he says that it has not, so the girl goes to find out for herself. Henry enters, and, to the heroine's thoughts, informs her that although Cardell is doing his job, he says that Julian will be accompanied by the butler and Leon. The prince is unhappy with the presence of the chief servant. The elf also conveys the words of the demon king that no matter what happens, Julian must know the measure. Henry leaves and they agree to leave in the coming days. Perry goes to inform Leon, but seeing the prince's irritated face suggests that the elf do it. The butler mentions that they still need to inform the nurse about the completion of the awakening and asks Julian to show some respect for the other demons, because at this rate, they won't even find someone on the road who can help. He grabs the heroine by the hand and orders her to follow him. In the castle, the prince asks her what she likes, precious stones, some food, maybe she has a hobby. But the girl answers that she doesn't like broccoli and wonders why the prince would know about it. Turning his back, he replies that he won't let her leave. When he fills this castle with everything Perry likes, she will not leave, even if she regrets it later. The butler assures him that she has no intention of leaving her young master. The prince does not believe her, but the girl says that she has never lied to him, which Julian disagrees with. He asks Perry to promise on her little fingers that she will never leave him. The heroine agrees, and the prince, gently taking her hand, puts his finger to his mouth and carefully bites through it. A servant tells Cardell about the unusual movements of the aristocratic demons. The king does not understand why they would seek information on Perry, as they have enough of their own troubles. But he is sure that his goal has been achieved and orders to find out why the demons are so interested in the doll. Henry is worried about the situation, because the prince has to go on a trip with the butler, who is now the center of attention. He needs to find a lover and an assistant, but Perry can only get in the way, and Julian's attitude towards her is a bit strange. Cardell says that this is why they are traveling together, 
But the elf is not reassured. He is worried about his young master. Cardell insists that the prince can take care of himself. He's grown up and can't be overcome so easily. Henry asks if he really doesn't need protection, but the king says that the doll needs help more than anything else because Julian can destroy it at any time. The butler is surprised that the young man can end her life so easily. It would be much better for Cardell if the prince could let the girl go so easily. Raising children is too hard. At this point, Julian bites his finger and asks Perry to swear with his soul that she will never leave him, but the surprised butler hesitates. She confidently tells the young master that she doesn't want to do it. The young man realizes what Perry said for the first time, that she doesn't want something. While Perry is rewinding his finger, the prince says that he feels much worse than he thought. The heroine offers to swear on anything but her soul, but this option does not suit the upset boy. The girl says that he already has a lot of things, and the prince does not accept her reassurances because he is no longer a child. Hearing this, Perry doesn't understand why he is behaving like this. The young master is told that they have brought luggage and money for the trip. Perry immediately rushes to pack everything and realizes that with the Demon King's money, he can live without obligations for at least five years. Calling out to the girl, the prince says that the trip is not the most important thing right now but she objects, saying that they may have to leave tomorrow. Julian sits down on the couch and stares at the butler, who is nervous about his behavior. When he gets up, he calls her to follow him to see his old friend. They arrive at the dungeon to find a mutilated Lef, who immediately begins to scream for his release. The Duke threatens him with his father's punishment, but the Prince says that he has only a title left. He is incapable of anything. Suddenly, Lef recognizes Julian in the grown man. The boy says that if the Duke looks at Perry again, he will tear out his eyes. The latter does not heed his words and looks up, only to be struck by dark forces in the chest. Lef asks him what he wants, and Julian, smiling, replies that he came in for nothing, because he likes the situation. When no one knows where Lef is, because he can't get out of this dungeon. Julian orders Perry to allow the demons of nightmares to enter the dungeon from now on, because it will be a pity when a good snack dies. They are about to leave, but the Duke starts crying out for help and mercy, as he was Julian's friend. Sitting down next to him and looking intently into his eyes, the Prince assures him that Perry has explained what Lef wants, namely, what benefits he wants. The boy explains to the frightened Duke how he wants to test whether demon aristocrats become idiots if all their energy is sucked out of them. The King is informed about Julian's decision to give the demons of nightmares access to the dungeon, and thinking about how much his son resembles his mother, he allows it. The elf simply cannot stand Cardell's frivolity and slaps himself on the forehead, while another servant reports that the Duke has combed all the nearby lands in search of his son. It will only be a matter of time before he learns that they have left. The king, calling the Duke persistent, says that the wine is surprisingly sweet today, to which the servant denies that it is not even close, Henry shoves him down and suggests that it's not the wine at all. Cardell has heard that they are old friends and that he and the Duke used to be friends too. But the two men firmly reject the King's suggestion. The demon orders them to leave Lef as he is. The servant says that there were many witnesses to Perry and Julian bringing him into the kingdom. Henry adds dejectedly that the butler did not restrain herself. Cardell is also told that the Duke returned to the estate this morning. He had a single demon escort with him, most likely because Perry had gotten rid of everyone else in the castle. The king has one thing that Chuck and Henry need to deal with. Henry needs to keep Julian in the manor as long as possible, perhaps asking the doll for help. Chuck needs to spread rumors that Lef is in a terrible condition and will die soon. But then the Duke will definitely come here for his son, and Cardell says that he can't send Julian to him, so he should come himself. Chuck should start a rumor about something worse than just using nightmare demons. Henry is worried that the king will get sick from drinking too much alcohol. He admits that today the memories of Julia are particularly strong. What good is a soul oath if unexpected situations cannot be avoided? It is the first morning when Perry goes to wake Julian up after his transformation. She thinks about how to do it right, because you can't roll a guy twice your size. Suddenly, the door opens in front of her and the prince appears. He invites the girl, surprised by the boy's early wake-up, to come in. There, she sees a happy nanny overwhelmed by a mountain of clothes. The lady says that the young master has grown up, so it is worth going through his wardrobe. 
Julian asks the butler to help him wash his face, because he hasn't done so yet. The nanny says that the prince was specifically waiting for the girl to arrive. Julian says that it no longer hurts when Perry washes him, although it used to. The butler thinks it's because of his thicker skin and unknowingly stretches the boy's cheeks. Frightened by her behavior, the butler recoils and says that he is indeed no longer a child. The prince confirms this, smiles sunny and asks for breakfast. The heroine asks if he will come with her, but he says that it is too noisy outside. Probably they are preparing for a welcome banquet, and at such moments it is better to pretend not to notice anything. Perry realizes that the prince looks like a real adult. Cardell declares a feast in honor of his son Julian, who has awakened his powers, and today everyone can eat and drink to their heart's content. A nanny finds the butler among the crowd of demons. She asks to taste the dish and says that she has fallen in love with the cook who prepared it. Suddenly, someone grabs Perry by the shoulder and it turns out to be the young owner, who also offers her a meal. When she refuses, he orders her to eat by force. The butler admits that it is really delicious. The girl asks Julian not to drink it all at once, because he will quickly get drunk, when a well-drunk demon appears from behind him and says that this is what alcohol is for. He offers the prince another glass of wine because he is an adult, to which he calmly agrees. Seeing Julian fill the glass, all the demons gather around him. Perry thinks that he has really matured because he used to explode whenever someone approached him. Henry finds a girl and asks her to monitor the prince's drinking. She replies that she will try, even though he hasn't been listening to her lately. As soon as the butler tries to say something to Julian, the demons surround her and insist on drinking. To the shocked looks of the guests, she easily drinks a barrel of wine and throws it away. The heroine pulls the prince out of the crowd by the hand and says that they have had enough, let the demons have their fun on their own. She takes Julian out to the balcony, where she asks him if he is okay. He asks Perry the same question, but she says that she is a doll, so she is always fine. Intoxicated, Julian touches her cheek and says that he is still worried about her. He gradually moves closer to her lips, but at the last moment he just hugs the butler by the neck. The girl says that they will ventilate a bit in the yard since he is so drunk, but the prince babbles that he is quite sober. His father tells Julian that he is obsessed with Perry. The prince asks why this is bad, because Cardell was obsessed with his wife, but it did not cause him any inconvenience. Doretzka admits that it is because Julian's mother was very strong. He, in turn, looks at Perry and confirms her words and adds that she is also strong. In the morning, Julian and Perry are in Cardell's office. He asks to wait until the gift he is preparing for the prince is ready, but the boy is categorically against it and asks for permission to leave tomorrow. The king recommends that he accept the gift, as it is very precious. Julian angrily says that he hopes it is not something trivial. Just then, Chuck enters the study and informs him that the gift has just arrived, so Cardell orders him to bring it into the study. The king tells Perry to go with the servant, but Julian protests that it is his butler. Cardell, reminding him of how the girl calls the prince, makes the disappointed boy realize that she does not consider him the master. If he wants to change that, he should take the throne as soon as possible. Julian turns his back on the girl and orders her to leave. The butler is surprised that the prince has suddenly decided to ask for permission to travel. Suddenly, Perry asks if the gift is something alive. Chuck confirms and turns around to ask if she has found something and is shocked to see a girl holding someone by the hair. She lets the man go, saying that he scared her. Perry learns that it is the Duke of Mirror to his cries of rudeness from the servants who know his identity. The butler stupidly says that she did not know. And who would ever think that a demon sneaking around the courtyard of someone else's estate is a grand duke? Chuck tells her that the king is expecting him and that the gossip he heard was true. Zerka asks in an angry voice if his son is really being mocked here, and the servant confirms this. Perry thinks that the sucking of energy by the demons of nightmares is also a kind of torture. The duke orders him to be taken to the king, whom he will immediately kill. While in the study, they are informed that the Duke of Zerk has arrived. Julian asks his father what it all means, but he informs him that it is the gift he was talking about. Zerka starts shouting for his son left to be given to him immediately, but an enraged Henry attacks him with a knife and says that the Duke is in front of the king, so he needs to watch his words. The Duke is not easily frightened. 
Julian asks why the mirror is his gift, since it will be of no use. Enraged by these words, the Duke wants to attack the Prince, but Perry interrupts him in time. She aggressively attacks the attacker and tells him that he cannot start a fight so recklessly. Henry knocks Zerk to the floor and asks if the Prince is okay. Chuck notices a wound on the butler's neck, but it heals quickly. Julian says that his Perry is a doll, so she can't be killed easily. He asks her if she's okay, and when she says yes, he tells the Duke to follow him in silence if he wants to see his son. Cardell says that his son is very kind to their intruder, but Julian replies that it is not known whether he is acting well or badly. The king watches his son drink a jar of potion and confirms for himself that the prince really looks like Julian. The three of them go down to the dungeon, where they see the demons of nightmares feasting on Lef. The prince orders the disappointed demonesses to leave, as they have had enough for one day. Zerka rushes to her son and asks what they did to him, but Julian says that he would not have been locked up if he had not done something stupid. The duke does not understand what exactly Lef is being accused of. Julian comes up close and explains that he tried to kill him, thinking he was a weakling. Zerka does not believe him, because his son would never do such a thing, but the prince does not care. The butler realizes that the duke really cares about his son. Nevertheless, it turns out that he did not even know that Lef had embezzled all the money and sent mercenaries to kill Julian. Shocked by Perry's words, the duke says that it is not easy to live with such a foolish offspring and suggests that it would be a gift for him to have his son conscious. But when he takes the knife, he wounds Zerk. Perry realizes that the prince wants to absorb Lef's energy, which is why he drank the potion. The butler tries to talk him out of it and remind him of the side effects, but he refuses and asks if she is worried that he will lose his power of destruction. Julian takes the girl by the chin and tells her not to worry, although sometimes he still wants her to worry about him. Perry replies that she already thinks about him, and the prince insists that she think more. The boy says that he wonders if his father will allow them to go on a trip now and returns to Cardell's office. Julian informs him that the gift was so large that it took a lot of time to prepare it. The king asks what he did with it, and he receives a story about absorbing energy. He thinks that the son is too much like his mother, but not like him at all. The prince bows and thanks him for the compliment. Cardell is interested in the prince's future plans. The boy does not know, because prisoners are not only inferior to demons, but even to humans. Therefore, he can simply leave them in the nearest forest and let them figure it out on their own. Cardell realizes that the prince is not going to follow through. Julian tells him that he has already done everything he wants, but his father will have to throw away the gift wrapping. The king likes what the boy says. He smiles and calls for Chuck. The servant is ordered to let Lef and Zerk go and to tell the duke that he is now deprived of his title due to the lack of power that Julian has taken. In addition, Chuck is to report in detail how the two were going to kill his son. The prince asks if he can go on a trip, and Cardell wonders why he is so eager to leave. Julian thinks that the king wants the same thing, to pass on the throne and the title of Demon King as soon as possible. The Lord sadly confirms his words and allows him to leave, and he will protect their home for the time being. The prince and Perry are ready to set off, but they are waiting for Leon, and Julian is annoyed by his delay but the butler asks him to wait. The girl takes a scroll from her bag, wrapped in a ribbon with precious blue stones. Before that, Henry and Perry had a conversation in which he expressed concern about the prince's obsession with her. The girl convinces him that during the trip, they will definitely meet a faithful assistant and the love of his life, and that he will lose interest in the butler. Henry asks her to be careful and take a scroll with her, because the girl does not have magic, so it will be useful. With it, she will be able to contact the castle at any time. Perry doesn't think they'll need it, but the elf says that the scroll can even be used to disappear if they're cornered. Convinced, the butler asks Henry to tell Leon to start packing for the trip because the young master doesn't like it when she talks to him. The nervous elf agrees and tells her not to worry. A cheerful Leon comes to Perry and Julian. The girl asks him if he knows what time it is. He answers, and the butler with a murderous look reminds him of Henry's words yesterday, so that he will not be late, because he is scheduled to leave in the morning. While Perry is beating the servant, the prince orders them to leave and says that Leon will carry the butler's bags, and when he says that he himself is carrying heavy bags, Julian replies that he is not lighter. 
The girl looks at the prince sitting on a horse and thinks that he is quite handsome. She doesn't understand when the boy learned to ride. Leon tells Perry to get on the horse, since she is not going to walk, but the girl has never done it before. When she gets on, she doesn't understand why the horse is standing. Julian asks her if she has ever worked with horses, and she lies and says yes. The guy says that at least the horse can support the weight of two people, but the butler, thinking about it, summons the spirit of a forest wolf with a Takabi light and says that she would rather ride it. Leon is terrified that she has summoned a monster. Julian says that he will not go away like that, gives her his hand, and asks her to sit behind him. Perry climbs on the horse and hugs the prince tightly so that she doesn't fall off at his request. The girl is very embarrassed by the situation. The servant says that there are things that the butler cannot do, and he thought she was omnipotent. Perry says that there are many things he cannot do, and Leon wants to give an example. The girl says that death has no power over her. Leon thinks that she cannot kill herself, but the heroine denies it. She asks the young master, who was listening to their conversation at that moment, why they are standing there. After thinking for a minute, he kicks the horse and tells her that they are on their way to Delcaon. The servant says that at this time Delcon is hosting a festival in honor of the azalea blossoms, and Perry is confused by his excessive merriment. Delcaon is a huge city with humans, demons, and other races. It is also one of the best cities in the demon world. It's the perfect place for Julian to find his assistant and lover, so everything should go well. Upon entering the flourishing city, Perry realizes why Leon was so excited. He asks to leave for a moment, but the butler does not allow it. The girl tells Julian to watch the servant while she looks for something to eat. She gets in line to buy a kebab and an azalea honey drink, when a man calls out from behind her and asks if she would mind keeping him company, since they are both here alone. She says she has an escort, but the suspicious man doesn't believe her and thinks she's just marking up her price. If the girl goes with him, they will have a lot of fun. Grabbing her by the forearm, the man insists that she agree. Perry asks him not to interfere, because she is buying food for the young owner. The suspicious man says that she is not so simple and asks what kind of demons she serves. Just as she is about to answer, Julian appears in front of them with a stunned Leon in his arms and says that she is his butler. The man says that recently the whole rabble has been treated with respect and asks whose son Julian is. Perry breaks his arm for saying that, because the boy in front of him is from a respected family. The prince asks why she was gone for so long, and the girl says that there is a line. But upon hearing this, all the people in front of her instantly parted ways. The girl realizes that she should have agreed when Julian offered to go together. The guy is upset because one damaged arm was clearly not enough. Next time let the heroine break his legs as well. The prince orders to find out what family the man is from and gives Leon a drink of azalea. The servant asks Perry what about the night's stay. Julian is convinced that they are unlikely to find any rooms available because the festival is in full swing. The butler apologizes because she doesn't need sleep, so she didn't even think about it. The servant is unhappy with the situation and says that he will not go to negotiate with anyone else until he meets Julian's fierce gaze. Saddened, Leon leaves to find a hotel. Perry asks if the prince likes the drink, and he replies that it is quite sweet and flavorful. The butler recalls that this city is ruled by the demon king and then wonders why there are no azaleas growing in the castle to make the same drink. The prince thinks that the reason may be the difficulty of storing these flowers. Julian asks why the girl doesn't eat and receives the standard answer that she is a doll. The heroine offers to go buy something else to eat. Julian gets up from the table and calls her to follow him. He buys food for the butler and makes her taste it. The embarrassed girl tells him that it is very tasty and watches as a completely happy Julian takes a bite. At some point, Perry realized that everyone was watching them. The crowd, regardless of age and gender, could not take their eyes off the grown-up Julian. While the heroine herself saw him as a former prince, the couple continued to walk down the street when suddenly the blushing prince dropped his dish and grabbed his head. Frightened, Perry asks what hurts the young man while he is writhing on the pavement. He says that everything is itchy and the girl thinks it's an allergy. The heroine asks to clarify the symptoms and the prince says he has a headache. The butler thinks the food was poisoned. She will not survive if something happens to Julian. 
Perry asks him to take some medicine first, while she looks to see if there is a pharmacy nearby. The prince knocks the bottle out of her hands and grabs her wrist, asking her to stay. Suddenly, Leon comes running in with good news about the apartment, so the problem is solved. He notices the young owner and asks what happened to him. Perry replies that he doesn't know, perhaps something with food or drink. Seeing the empty Azalea drink cup and laughing, Leon tells him that this is what happened. The butler does not understand what is happening. The servant says that it is a kind of love potion, thinking that Perry knows about it. But the girl is sure that Leon set it all up and grabbing him by the chest, asks him why he didn't tell her earlier. Leon justifies himself with the prince's maturation and the lack of danger in the drink. Perry takes Julian in his arms and tells the servant to show him where the house is. Leon says that there is no cure for this, but in about three hours it should be easier. He asks for permission to go out and have fun as a gift for a job well done. The butler chases him away and orders him to come back alive. The girl thinks that it would have been better to take a nanny. Getting out of bed, Julian suddenly asks if Perry will always be with him. Hugging him, the doll says that everything is fine because she is there. The touched prince pushes her away. He knows that she is going to leave anyway. Perry realizes that he can't promise to always be with the boy now. During the journey, he will find his beloved. And after the third awakening, she must return to the spirit world. According to Leon, the Azalea drink is a love potion. Perhaps now they will be able to find the prince's fate. But as soon as Perry imagines Julian with another demoness, he feels uneasy. Approaching the girl, the prince asks for permission to kiss her. Perry doesn't understand what it feels like. Julian set off on a journey to find an advisor and a lover, and she only spoils everything. Henry says that Leon can't be trusted, he shouldn't have been sent on the road. But Cardell is sure that with the arrival of the butler, Julian has become more restrained, and he does not have much hope for the mind of the chief servant. He has faith only in his son and the doll. The elf is worried about the prince's excessive obsession with Perry, because the young master cannot love the doll in principle. He is only fixated on his childhood memories. The king is sure that Henry considers the prince to be a child. But in Cardell's opinion, Henry thinks too straightforwardly, because there is only one step between love and attachment. He orders the butler to tell Chuck his request. The latter is to spread the rumor that Perry is a representative of the dragons. He also needs to find a representative of this race, because due to the agreement between their worlds, dragons cannot interfere in the affairs of demons. The only exception is a relative who is on someone else's territory. So let's say a rumor spreads that one of the dragons is making friends with demons. Cardell wonders when love became such a strong feeling and what his son will choose as a result. But Julian still kisses the enchanted Perry sweetly. The girl continues to stare at the prince for a long time, and then his nose begins to bleed, and the young man faints to the nervous cries of the butler. In the morning, as soon as he wakes up, Julian looks for Perry. She appears at his side and asks how he is feeling, to which the boy replies that he is fine. The prince says that the girl did not go to bed, and she repeats that sleep is unnecessary for a doll, but he should rest. Julian sees no need to rest without her and, looking at the heroine, hugs her tightly. Perry gets up and asks the prince to sleep some more, and then they will go on their way. He confusedly asks the girl why she is so cold to him. Perry, making a dumb face, says that it is logical, because she is not alive, but synthetically created, and goes in search of Leon, leaving the prince alone. And the chief servant is actively courting all sorts of demons until he is struck down by the butler's crown jewel. They go home together, and Leon asks how the young master feels after the love potion, but Perry says that it has worn off under the chief servant's disappointed grumbling. The girl cannot calm down. She tries to convince herself that yesterday's situation was only a consequence of the potion, which led to a big mistake, and that Julian will soon forget her. Perry orders her to pack her things because they are leaving soon. Leon wants to convince her, because there are still three days until the end of the festival, there is a lot of delicious food, young demons, and in the evening the fireworks festival will begin, and this is where the young master can meet his soulmate. He convinces the butler with these words to stay another day. When the girl enters the room, she sees a half-naked prince, and when he asks why she didn't come earlier, she replies that she thought he was asleep. Perry flies out of the bedroom under the pretext of buying food for breakfast. Her heart is pounding, and she can barely control her emotions. 
Leon is not happy with the carrot stew for breakfast because he wants to absorb energy like the other demons. But the prince orders them to eat in silence because the butler has taken care of their breakfast. It turns out that Julian knew about the effect of the potion, which surprised Perry. Leon asks if something happened between the two of them last night. The girl tries to deny it, but Julian says that something happened that cannot be forgotten.